Most individuals lack a true understanding of how lengthy eternity endures, often conflating it with the idea of infinity. However, my personal experience revealed that eternity spanned precisely 15 years, 2 months, 27 days, and several peculiar hours. It concluded much as it began, with my wife, Tracy, affectionately locking eyes with her partner and sharing a passionate kiss. Except this time, I was this partner for the first time, and the kiss followed my proposal for her to be mine forever on the night I presented the engagement ring. In a different setting, I found myself a mere bystander in a restaurant two towns away from our residence, as Tracy and an apparent new lover exchanged adoring glances and leaned in for a passionate kiss. The details of how I ended up in the same restaurant as this couple are irrelevant. Their location, an hour away from our hometown, indicated a deliberate effort to remain discreet. Initially curious, my emotions swiftly shifted from curiosity to shock, disgust, and anger. As the scene unfolded before me, I briefly entertained the thought of confronting them physically. However, I was always taught never to smack a woman, so I sat there in complete astonishment. Since they focused solely on each other, feeling secure that no one who knew them would see, they leisurely enjoyed their meal, occasionally engaging in a kissing game. I ate slowly, had dessert, and observed them throughout. My emotions fluctuated between rage and helplessness. Upon finishing their meal, they stood up, held hands, and left. Seated there in silent rage, I felt like the most ignorant fool. I had been married to Tracy for over 14 years, with two exclusive years preceding that. Yet, I never suspected she was switching both ways. She never showed interest in another woman, never dropping hints in any conversation we ever had. I erroneously believed I knew her inside and out, anticipating growing old together. The revelation of her switch-hitting paled in comparison to the anger I felt at her apparent infidelity, regardless of the gender of her partner. She had redirected her love, betraying the commitment we made many years ago. When she accepted my ring, it signified an enduring eternity, seemingly timeless. Who would have thought that some eternities have an expiration date? Settling the bill, I entered the car and drove home slowly. I had much to contemplate. Tracy did not anticipate my early return after the trip, but fortunately, I resolved all issues ahead of schedule. Hence, I headed home on Friday evening instead of Saturday afternoon as initially planned. I had been away since Monday morning, and apart from missing Tracy and the kids, the absence of closeness for more than three consecutive days left me with pent-up energy that needed release, at least until I witnessed what unfolded in the restaurant. I was an hour away from our hometown, and could have easily driven straight through. However, since I was ahead of schedule, I opted to go out to dinner for a break from driving, and the rest, as they say, is history. Our kids are 12 and 10, old enough to be left alone for the evening if Tracy wanted to go out, which I had no issue with. However, I wondered if they were aware of the situation, since neither had mentioned anything different. Perhaps they were as in the dark as I was, I thought. Regardless, I knew they wouldn't be pleased with what happened next. On the way home, I engaged in the usual self-analysis. What did I do wrong, how long did it last, etc. At least I didn't have to worry about her lover having a larger manhood than me. Chuckling, I'm talking about myself. Gallows humor. I walked in the door at nine, and Tracy still wasn't home. My daughters Lisa, 12, and Ariel, 10, greeted me happily, but I watched without truly seeing them nervous and doubtful that I would be home early. The same couldn't be said for Tracy. When Tracy entered about two hours later, she must have noticed my car in the garage and freshened up a bit. I observed a shift in her demeanor, appearing less content than in our previous encounters. She inquired about my unexpected presence, expressing concern with her first words. I responded playfully, emphasizing her greeting. Tracy, with a slight twitch in her forehead, mentioned that if she had known I would be home early, she would have prepared a nice dinner. She went on to reveal that she had ordered pizza for the kids, and she and Kate had opted for wine and sandwiches downtown. Tracy, avoiding eye contact, asked if I remembered Kate from my office and if she had mentioned her before. Despite her dishonesty, I replied affirmatively. Tracy then proceeded to sarcastically recall Kate as a blonde with ample chest, remarking on the trail of admirers she left behind. 
I couldn't help but think that Tracy had the ability to assemble a football team merely by entering a room. This wasn't solely due to her captivating effect on married women. Kate, I mused to myself, possessed the allure of a goddess with her remarkable chest. She was about 26 years old and had started working at the insurance company where Tracy had worked the previous year. The two became instant friends, and apparently, somewhere down the line, at 39 years old, Tracy could still turn more than a few heads. She was also blonde, with a beautiful figure and curves in all the right places. She was only 10 pounds heavier than when we first met, but it was still a great package, and at least until recently, it was exclusively my package. Despite the worried expression on her face, Tracy acted calmly. As for me, I could barely stand on my feet, so I just told her that I was tired and was going to bed. She gave me a quick peck on the lips as I walked past her and headed up the stairs. Perhaps I was mistaken, but I was almost sure that I felt the taste of love-making games on her lips. I went to bed but did not fall asleep. The kids went to bed before me, so when I heard a quiet conversation a few minutes later, I realized Tracy was talking to Kate on the phone. It was a short conversation, and a few minutes later, I heard Tracy getting into the shower in our master bathroom. Either I scared her so much that she quit the game and wasn't as careful as before, or she thought I was dreaming and wouldn't find out about it. My heart sank even lower. Between kid stuff and housework, I didn't have to interact with Tracy too much for the rest of the weekend. She wanted to have a family dinner on Saturday night, but I said I wasn't in the mood and just left the room, effectively ending the conversation. She must have known something was up because I'm rarely rude to her. On Monday morning at work, I requested a day off from my boss due to some personal issues I was facing. Having gone through a divorce about 10 years ago and remarried five years ago, John, my boss, had some understanding that something was amiss in the Mason family. Considering the success of my sales trip the previous week, he didn't hesitate when I asked for time off. As I prepared to leave his office, he handed me his business card, revealing it to be that of his divorce lawyer. He conveyed his regret, expressing sorrow for the unexpected turn in my relationship with Tracy. I acknowledged his sentiment, stating that I, too, had envisioned a lasting connection with Tracy. Acting on my boss's suggestion, I sought legal advice two days later. Despite my lawyer's potential for a more professional approach, she displayed genuine concern for my emotions and offered gentle guidance. She seemed surprised when I decided against hiring a private investigator to gather concrete evidence of Tracy's infidelity. I detected understanding in her gaze as she pointed out that, in a no-fault state, such evidence might not carry much weight. The primary concern, she noted, could revolve around potential challenges with visitation rights, although she expressed confidence that this would likely not be a significant issue, no matter how hard I tried. Being around Tracy and the girls at home was something I couldn't handle. Tracy likely sensed this, given our minimal communication. I believe the girls sensed something was amiss by our unusual quietness. I gave Tracy numerous chances to talk, but she never seized the opportunity. The situation escalated when Tracy was served at work the following week. Call it petty if you will, but I wanted Tracy to experience even a fraction of the pain I felt. I presume she was served around 11.03 a.m., because my phone started ringing incessantly at 11.05. I ignored all 15 calls from her and several from unfamiliar numbers, suspecting she might be using friends' phones to contact me. Surprisingly, I felt a surge of energy for the first time since discovering her with Kate, and I was having a surprisingly good day. Tracy's car was already in the garage when I arrived at 5.30. She wasted no time acknowledging her presence, expressing her anger about being served in front of friends and colleagues. I remained silent until entering the house and putting down my things. The girls were in the living room, engrossed in what seemed to be a movie on the big screen. I calmly stated that I wanted to ensure she was served alongside her mistress for her own comfort. Tracy's anger disappeared, replaced by tears. I retorted, questioning her knowledge about Kate and remarking on the lack of caution in their actions. I asked her two things, how long and when she had planned to tell me. She responded, admitting it had been about six months and insisting they were planning to inform me soon. In less than 30 seconds, Tracy's demeanor shifted from venomous to defeated. She stumbled to the kitchen table and sat down. I walked over to the drinks cabinet, grabbed a bottle of Buffalo Trace bourbon, poured myself a double, and sat across from her. 
if looks could homicide, she would have perished within the first two seconds. I observed her, and she couldn't tear her eyes away from the table. Quietly, I asked how I couldn't have known about her switch-hitting after all this time. She responded that she, too, had only recently discovered it about herself. She insisted it wasn't planned, it just happened. Finally, she looked at me and held my gaze, saying that it shouldn't change anything between us. Tracy expressed her continued love for me and the need to explore this new aspect of herself. She asked for my support and more time to explore, stating that it was her turn. I expressed my shock, questioning whether six months was insufficient for her exploration. I mentioned that if she truly loved me, she would remember our vows and not entertain the idea of exploring at all. I shared my belief that fidelity transcended gender, and she shouldn't have considered such actions. She countered by suggesting that true love could forgive a mistake, to which I argued that once could be a mistake, but six months indicated a conscious decision. I expressed my frustration, emphasizing that love should not give her the license to tear my heart out and jeopardize our family. I asserted that her actions had nothing to do with gender, labeling her self-centered. She retorted, insisting that it had a lot to do with girls and accused me of being a complainer. I confronted her, accusing her of turning into a piece of garbage before my eyes and challenged her love for me, claiming she now loved me like a pet rather than a man. I accused her of being in love with the other woman, pointing out that I had fallen to second place. When she denied it, I yelled at her to stop, asserting that I knew what I saw and knew her better than anyone else. She looked guilty, and it dawned on her that I had seen them together. Despite her quick attempt to salvage the situation, I argued that it didn't change the fact that she loved someone else instead of me. I expressed the sentiment that everything might have been different if it were another man. At least then, I could confront him. She asked if we could be civil, to which I responded uncertainly, acknowledging the painful truth that she had fallen in love with a woman who had become her mistress, ultimately stealing my wife. A few months later, I learned that the children knew nothing about Tracy's affair. They thought that Aunt Kate was just a close friend of Mom's. They had both seen the occasional quick kiss and gentle touch. But since Aunt Kate wasn't a man, they didn't think there was anything inappropriate. I found out about this one night, when the kids and I went out to dinner, and the kids mentioned that Kate had been spending more time in the house since I moved in. They seemed to have figured out that Aunt Kate was one of the reasons Tracy and I were getting a divorce. Since we live in a no-fault divorce state, our finances were pretty much split down the middle. I had to pay her child support. She got the house until the kids went to college. And of course, I had to pay child support. I moved into an apartment about 15 minutes from my old home. I was completely crushed. Tracy and I kept in touch through the girls. They were involved in all sorts of activities, both in and out of school. And Tracy and I tried our best to show them that we were going to support them as much as possible. I don't know why, but Tracy fought hard with the divorce, and it dragged on for a year before we finally did it. I was polite, nothing more, when I ran into Tracy and Kate at my daughter's parties. As for family events, I was always invited. But knowing that Tracy would be there, I apologized and escaped for forgiveness. I know I was giving up some wonderful family memories, but it took everything I had to keep my composure when she and Kate were around. I did a solo day for the kids to give them birthday and Christmas gifts. As you might expect, each of us retained the friends we had before we got married. Almost all the friends we made after we got married stayed with Tracy. As one of the husbands explained to me, many of them felt awkward around me, given that I had lost my wife to a woman. The consensus seemed to be that I somehow deserved it, and several of our married women friends almost made just that claim. I let them go without a fight because, as the old saying goes, you learn who your real friends are under adverse conditions. By my own choice, I didn't date much for the next few years. My heart certainly wasn't ready for this, and I didn't need much communication. After a year of being alone, I went to the local animal shelter and adopted a German shepherd who was probably about three years old. I actually went to the shelter and asked them to show me the three dogs that had been there the longest. The one I chose had been there since he was a frisky puppy, but after being rejected repeatedly, he turned into a quiet, reclusive animal with the saddest pair of eyes I've ever seen on an animal. I felt like we were soulmates because we were both rejected. The dog's name was Bob, 
Not some cute animal name or something named after a cute Disney character. Just Bob. Bob caught me, and I caught Bob. The first thing he did when I brought him into my apartment after sniffing around was to climb onto the couch next to me and curl up next to me. He was good with the girls when I had them over on the weekends, but I think Bob liked it best when it was just us guys. He loved to walk or ride with me, and we could talk about almost any topic. Admittedly, Bob was mostly silent during these conversations, but I knew from the look on his face and ears that he was paying attention to everything I said. A few years later, my oldest daughter Lisa met a guy from Boston in college and got married. Since I was doing pretty well in my engineering career, I could afford to give her the wedding of her dreams. I couldn't have been more proud of her as I walked her down the aisle. But after the service, I earned a reprimand from her for ruining my one line. I realized this right during the rehearsal, but under the pressure of the real situation, my voice cracked. Coming to my senses, I responded to the question of who was marrying Tracy off with a simple I instead of the correct her mother and I. I admitted to almost choking on my words. Taking my seat in the front row beside Tracy, she leaned towards me and quietly remarked that it was disgusting, and I knew it. Kate, seated next to Tracy, leaned forward and audaciously glared at me. I discreetly told her to forget it with just my lips, checking if the pastor noticed our exchange. Wedding ceremonies always bring back memories for me, and at first, I looked back on my wedding day fondly. This memory lasted about 30 seconds before I mentally pictured Tracy and Kate together in the restaurant when I found out about them. When I awoke from my reverie, Tracy was looking at me sadly. She blushed and quickly looked away. I guess I wasn't the only one taking a walk down memory lane. Although I didn't try to watch, I noticed that Tracy and Kate seemed to be having a great time together with Lisa and her new husband Jerry and almost everyone else. It was then that I noticed I was one of the few single people over 50 in the room. Feeling sorry for myself, I went to the open bar and ordered a shot of 18-year-old Irish whiskey. Taking my glass, I sat down at my table and quietly patted myself on the back for hosting such a grand event. Three years later, I was about to play the father of the bride again when my youngest, Ariel, had her beau walk her down the aisle. This time, I decided not to go it alone and finally made a concerted effort to meet people. Returning home from a three-day trip out of state three weeks later, I stopped at a small bar restaurant about an hour from my apartment. Though I usually avoid such bars due to my dislike of country western music, they were advertising pork BBQ, so I had to stop. The food was great, and as the DJ started playing music around 8 p.m., I looked around in case there might be someone worth chatting with, so to speak. Just then, a 30-year-old black woman with the face of an angel walked through the door. She was absolutely gorgeous, and I wondered why an unmarried young black woman was at the bar at this time. On the other hand, there I was, the lonely old white guy. I knew she was probably too young for me, but damn it. I motioned to the bartender to put everything she drank on my tab. He told her that her drink was paid for and gestured in my direction. She walked over to my table to thank me, and I invited her to sit down. To my surprise, she sat down next to me and introduced herself as Jade. During a pleasant evening, she suggested going to her place, catching me off guard. Without hesitation, we headed towards the door when a man in a cowboy hat approached Jade and lightly kissed her cheek. I halted abruptly, and Jade reassured me, introducing him as her husband, Fred. She asked if he could join and have a look, to which Fred grinned and mentioned their involvement. I expressed my discomfort stating there was something wrong with the situation and the messed up generation. I raised my hands, signaling them to stop, and left alone to my car. In another attempt to find companionship, I turned to my church. Carrie, a 50-year-old divorcee with long black hair, 34B chest, long legs, and a big smile, and I got along well. After a few dates, we went back to my apartment, leading to closeness. However, during the encounter, she began muttering her ex-husband Jim's name. The situation escalated as she screamed it during subsequent climaxes. I stopped immediately, explaining that I wasn't Jim. In response, she expressed genuine anger and questioned why I had stopped. In silence, I drove her home, and needless to say, there was no fifth date. For my next dating venture, I invited a co-worker over for an evening of food and dancing. Allison Webb, a vivacious 42-year-old divorcee who had separated from her husband almost five years ago, was a blonde with slightly larger chest and a bump 
than someone of average proportions. We had been friends at work for about ten years, and by this point she had heard my sad story, and I had heard hers. Our great evening turned into several wonderful evenings, and we genuinely enjoyed each other's company even before our first time being make love. Looking forward to a great time at the wedding, I invited Allison to be my date. She responded seriously, expressing uncertainty about accompanying me to my daughter's wedding, considering the family dynamics with my ex-wife. I mentioned that she would need the green light from Bob, my wingman, a 45-pound German shepherd mix with sophisticated taste. I explained that if Bob didn't like her, he wouldn't accompany me to the wedding. She found this peculiar and labeled me a strange person. After passing Bob's test the following week, Allison agreed to be my wedding date, bringing joy to the girls who were happy I wouldn't be attending solo. Tracy, however, appeared displeased with this arrangement, consistently giving me disgruntled looks. Since I didn't engage much with her, I disregarded her opinion. However, it bothered Allison, who sensed Tracy's dislike for her. At the rehearsal dinner, I found Tracy alone and finally confronted her, asking about her problem. Tracy responded with sarcasm, expressing disdain for Allison and questioning if I was now dating Girl Scouts. I noted that Tracy's jealousy didn't look good on her, reminding her that Allison, Tracy, and Kate were the same age. I playfully remarked that Tracy had traded me for a younger female version, and she responded with shy grace. A year later, Allison became my second wife, and life went on. Truthfully, I had completely forgotten that I was on the bone marrow registry when I got a call one day at work and was told that after 30 years, I was a match for someone. Thrilled at the opportunity to help save someone's life, I knew the bone marrow extraction would be somewhat inconvenient, but my hero complex made me more than willing to undergo the procedure. Further testing was required, and if it was favorable, the extraction would be scheduled for two weeks. After granting my consent, I told them I was on board. While not very religious, I believe in God, and there's an old saying that God works in mysterious ways. I never thought about it until four days later when I spoke on the phone with my oldest daughter Lisa during our weekly conversation. Ariel and I avoid discussing Tracy's life, but Lisa mentioned that bone marrow had been found for Aunt Kate, and they were actively involved. Through Lisa, I conveyed my best wishes to Kate and Tracy, expressing that despite the pain caused by their actions, I didn't wish them damage. Lisa warned that as an adult, I could call them myself. I acknowledged this, but explained that the less I talked to them, the less likely I was to say something unpleasant that I might regret later. Lisa encouraged me to come to terms with the divorce, highlighting that I've been happily married to Allison for almost two years. Acknowledging my happiness, I shared that while I no longer hated Tracy, she wasn't on my Facebook friends list. I decided to send Tracy flowers with a card of good wishes. Later, as I ordered the bouquet, a thought struck me. Bone marrow matches are rare, and the coincidence of Kate finding a match around the same time as me seemed too convenient. Aware of the anonymity in the donation process, I contacted my registry contact, pretending to be optimistic, and inquired about the likelihood of my match living in the same city. She stuttered and admitted it was the first time someone had identified their match. Frustrated, I realized I was going to donate bone marrow to Tracy. Angered by the situation, I reflected on how she stole my wife, never apologized and now expected me to save her life through a bone marrow donation. I determined it wouldn't happen. Two days later, I called my receptionist back and said I was refusing to make the donation. She almost burst into tears, and when she came to her senses, she asked me if there was any specific reason why I backed down. She explained that although I had the right to refuse, this was almost never done and would cause great consternation at the registry. I apologized for causing horror but told her it was in my own best interest to refuse. She muttered that she was sorry and told me that if I changed my mind in the very near future, I should call her. Allison was furious when I told her I had turned down the donation. I didn't tell her that I found out who the donation was supposed to go to. She just knew that I had abandoned the obligation to possibly save someone's life. My wife expressed her frustration, practically screaming at me, questioning why, after expressing the desire to help, I now wanted to ruin someone's life. 
It was the first time I heard Allison use strong language, and I decided to be honest with her, explaining that I wouldn't have informed my ex-wife or Kate about the donation if I had a choice. She was unimpressed by my reasoning, accusing me of denying Kate a chance at life for revenge. I clarified that it wasn't revenge, emphasizing my efforts to have as little in common with my ex-wife and Kate as possible since they both hurt me. Allison questioned if they knew about her involvement, and I assured her that everything was done anonymously, and I only found out about it by luck. As I shared this, Allison's expression softened. She argued that I couldn't refuse the opportunity to save someone's life, emphasizing the weight of holding Kate's life in my hands. She whispered that I was too nice a guy to withhold help, and that the guilt would eventually consume me. I disagreed, stating that I wouldn't feel guilty as Kate and Tracy had broken my heart. I emphasized that they would never know it was me. Allison expressed concern, mentioning the hope they had and how my decision might have ruined it for them. Allison and I continued to have disagreements, and it felt like we were growing apart as a couple. Our differences seemed more pronounced than ever. At one point, she asked about my Christian charity, to which I responded by questioning whether I should blindly give money to someone who might damage me. She called me ridiculous in response. I explained that they hadn't torn out my heart and turned my world upside down like they did to me. I expressed my reluctance to simply shrug off the pain and help them after 17 years. I reminded her that Tracy had been married to Kate longer than to her, and suggested she deal with it. Allison insisted they had made a decision, and I replied quietly that they could live or not, indifferent to their fate. A few days later, on a Saturday afternoon, I left the room, informing Allison that I was going to the range to blow off some steam. She reminded me to be back before dinner as the girls were coming and didn't want me to smell like gunpowder, instructing me to take a shower before we ate. I knocked the living crap out of the target with 500 rounds from my 9mm whitefish. I can't explain why, but shooting always relaxes me. I think it's because you have to really concentrate on what you're doing, and when you stop concentrating so hard, your body goes into a relaxed mode. At least that's my thought, and I stand by it. I definitely smelled like gunpowder when I got home. So when I got home, I quickly headed to the shower. I glanced at the dining table. There was set for six people, and from the smell, Allison was cooking a roast. She is a great cook, and I was hoping she would make these little brown potatoes instead of mashed potatoes. After taking a shower, I poured myself a glass of rye whiskey and brought Ellie a glass of wine. She seemed a little nervous, which I put down to her wanting the dinner to be perfect for the girls and their husbands. I kissed her on the lips. I was sitting in the living room reading on the computer when the door opened and the girls came in not accompanied by their husbands, but by Tracy and a shabby-looking Kate. I wasn't happy to see any of them, and I shot Allison a glare as I stood up to greet everyone. I kissed both girls, but didn't say anything to my ex or Kate. I noticed that they greeted Allison with what could be called enthusiasm. There seemed to be a lot of whispering around. Not having been born yesterday, I immediately knew that Allison had orchestrated this little intervention. I was more inclined to think of it as an ambush since apparently I was the only one unaware of the meeting. I thought about just taking my phone and leaving, but then I decided it was time for me to speak up. At first, however, I had to endure the excuse that it was just a nice meal with family and friends. Kate's illness was the main topic of conversation at the table, although I took no part in it. Sitting with what I thought was a thoughtful expression on my face, I suppose dinner and dessert were good. I really couldn't tell. Being the good host, I provided everyone with their afternoon drinks, and we moved into the living room. After a moment of silence, I decided it was time to express my thoughts. I questioned who would speak first, the woman who had betrayed my trust to arrange the meeting, the woman who had broken my heart years ago but now believed I owed her a favor, or perhaps the woman who had taken a married woman from her unsuspecting loving husband and now needed help for a chance at life. As I made my statement, I looked at each face in turn, and none of the women could meet my gaze. Allison seemed excited when I called her name, and my eldest daughter, Lisa, took the initiative to speak. She acknowledged my lingering anger towards mom and Aunt Kate, but criticized my refusal to donate bone marrow as childish and petty, stating it was beneath me. 
Lisa argued that seeking revenge by denying someone a chance at life was wrong, emphasizing that it involved a person's life, not a frivolous act, like hitting someone with a whipped cake. I took a sip of rye whiskey and cleared my throat, shaking my head slightly. I expressed my anger and stated that every action in life has consequences. I noted that Tracy and Kate never expected such severe consequences, but were now trying to make their problem mine. I highlighted the unexpected opportunity to make a difference in the life of someone who had wronged me. Despite their belief that it was driven by revenge, I suggested it might also be a way for me to regain some self-respect. After all, how much self-respect could I have if I helped the man who stole my wife survive? And I don't think any of you even consider the fact that you think I should be easier on Kate because she's a woman. If her name was Carl and he was a 200-pound man, most of you would probably think that I would be right about what I do. But it doesn't matter to me that Kate is a woman. She's a wife-stealing cow. She knew what she was doing was wrong. Kate attempted to convey her feelings by staring intensely at the carpet. Seated beside her on the couch, Tracy reached over and gently squeezed Kate's hand. I asserted that my decision was not driven by revenge, but by hatred towards Kate. I expressed that I despised her, harboring no intention of assisting her in any situation. I highlighted my minimal communication with her during the 17 years she was with Tracy. Tracy sniffled, holding back tears, and questioned whether I hated her to the extent that I would deprive someone else of a chance to live. She appealed to my past love for her, suggesting that considering it a noble thing to do would be a matter of honor. I retorted, expressing skepticism about Tracy's notion of honor, calling her a fancy woman, and stating that she had no right to lecture me on what honor is. My volume level rose, and I tried my best not to tell them all, including Allison, to burn in hell and leave me alone. I took a couple of deep breaths, and Allison apparently decided that I wasn't angry enough with her. She quietly told me that I'm a good person and always do the right thing, emphasizing that retreating is wrong and that I would never be able to live with myself if I did that. Lisa interjected, reminding me that I taught Ariel and her to always do the right thing, even if it seems wrong. Acknowledging this, I asserted that my decision was for me, to avoid any regrets or loss of sleep. Kate suddenly exclaimed, pleading with me not to let her die. Despite acknowledging the offense I felt, she appealed to the grim reality of her situation, mentioning the slim chances of survival, unless I donated my bone marrow. Kate's eyes looked haunted. Asking me to help save her life must have been the hardest thing she's ever done. I looked deep into those haunted eyes. I did not feel the joy of confirming my decision, but I confirmed it. No, that's all, I said. I didn't say the phrasey, I'm sorry because frankly, I wasn't sorry. I won't do anything in my power to help this woman. Kate took my answer better than Tracy, who burst into tears. Allison walked over to the couple to calm them down, and I heard her whisper, I'll try, I'll talk to him. She was so caught up in the moment that Allison never realized that she had put our marriage in jeopardy. I will have to think long and hard about whether I can bridge the gap in our trust. I grabbed the car keys from the key ring where they were located. I walked out the door while five women cried. I didn't return for three days. I didn't answer any of the dozens of phone calls from Allison or the kids. The house was dark. I quickly looked around and decided that Allison had stopped somewhere else for the time being. A suitcase and some clothes were missing, but almost everything else was left untouched. I also grabbed my suitcase and packed a few things, taking most of my clothes and most of my belongings with me. I left my wedding ring in the middle of the kitchen table. Three days later at work, I received an anonymous call that turned out to be Allison. She expressed disbelief that our relationship was ending because I refused to be what she considered the biggest idiot in the world. I responded by expressing my astonishment at being married to someone who had completely violated my trust. I suggested that both of us could fix the situation, and if anyone was seeking revenge it wasn't me, but perhaps a higher power. I referenced the biblical saying, Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I criticized her for her actions, and remarked that she really sucked. Kate passed away two months after our official divorce, and I learned about it through the local newspaper obituary. I hadn't followed her case, and none of my daughters kept me informed. Despite the estrangement from my daughters after the confrontation, I stood firm in my belief and stance of not helping Kate, and neither I nor my girls backed down. My decision was the right one for me.
I never lost a minute of sleep over not giving Kate my bone marrow. The people at the bone marrow registry were not very understanding of my individual situation and completely crossed me off the list. I was fine with this because the likelihood of me getting a second match was extremely unlikely. Bob was a bit moody and not exactly thrilled with any of the women I'd brought home over the past year or so. But that was okay, because at 62, I wasn't really looking for wife number three. Somewhat surprisingly, I was still getting my share of good closeness. I learned that at that age, eligible women outnumbered eligible men about four to one. And if her health was good, there was a good chance my girlfriend was ready for a roll in the hay for the evening. Of course, we couldn't frolic with too much youth. After all, neither of us wanted to break a hip. But more often than not, we both enjoyed a nice roll in the hay. I jokingly called my ladies my handsome old singletons. I hadn't spoken to anyone in my family for over four years. When my youngest Ariel called to tell me that Tracy had died a few days ago, she thought I should know and invited me to the funeral. We had 15 good years together and had two kids, so I figured I should at least show up. Maybe I can improve my relationship with the girls. I sat in the back alone. It was a good ceremony. After the funeral, I approached the girls and their families. I received shy hugs from the girls, firm handshakes from their husbands, and shy greetings from my three grandchildren. We went to a nearby restaurant to talk. About three minutes passed before the first salvo was fired. This came from Lisa. She abruptly questioned why Aunt Kate was allowed to die, and I responded, noting the unchanged nature of the conversation after four years. Referring to Kate as a wife thief, I asserted that it would be the final discussion on the matter. Changing the topic, I pointed out a young man at the bar, suggesting a hypothetical scenario where he kissed Lisa. Jerry expressed without hesitation that he would damage him, and when asked about a potential affair, he stated the man would already be dead. I drew a parallel, mentioning that since he would be dead, Jerry wouldn't have to worry about donating bone marrow if he fell sick. Jerry agreed, and I clarified that I didn't save Kate's life, partly due to her being a woman, which may have been a mistake. I asserted that I shouldn't have saved the life of the man involved with my wife or the one who stole it. Jerry agreed with the realization dawning on him, and he looked around the room, observing understanding gradually light up in each pair of eyes. I quietly shared that I wasn't proud of my decision, but not ashamed either, explaining that Kate didn't deserve my compassion for stealing the love of my life. Ariel questioned how I could withhold compassion if I ever loved her mother. I confessed to having loved her mother deeply, but when she broke my heart, much of that love turned to hate. Acknowledging that I was just a man, not the monster portrayed by her mother, I expressed that things didn't turn out well for her mother, and karma eventually caught up with her and her friend. Tears filled the eyes of the other four adults in the room, while the children looked confused and worried. I recognized that it would take time for all of us to come to terms with the situation and suggested that we not dwell on the past as life goes on.